emphasis perhaps should be on the relationship between the United States and Canada because Scott's in Canada. So I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's going to turn out super well for us. Uh, you know, we've gotten along with Canada since 1872, um, and, uh, and 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 we don't want that to get messed up. You know, there's there's no. Uh, but uh, in case you're wondering why uh, why why Ann and Donna were were filling the gap there, and we appreciate them doing that. Uh, that's what's going on. Scott is in in Canada, hoping that the weather breaks so that he can uh, do the fishing that he went up there to do. So I I tend to do most of my fishing in the freezer section at Walmart. So I don't really I I mean you fly to Canada and it, get it frozen there, or you can you know anyway. But but anyway, so that's where he is. So please please pray for for Scott and and the folks that he's up there with. But that's not really our prayer emphasis today. Our prayer emphasis is third Sunday of the month and, and we go to national missions. And the focus I would ask you to, to, to look at this week and that, that we'll make mention of, we as Southern Baptists, one of our national ministry organizations is called the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. And we can talk about that, you know, all the details of that later. But one of their, one of our, they're our main advocacy group when it comes to government behavior in the United States of America. If, for example, if Ashley County were to do something ridiculous and unthinkable, like pass a pass a law that said, oh, on second thought, you can't have church on Sunday, you can only have church on Tuesday nights at 9.30. I had to come up with something bizarre. Uh, and we needed some help about how to get Ashley County to not, you know, Hey, we need to take that to court and get that thrown out because that's a, there, there's no viable reason for it. The Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, that's the religious liberty part of that. Hey, how do we, you know, how do we do that? How do we fight that that problem? Um, and so they, they do a lot of good work. They've done a lot of the work that where we as Southern Baptists for the last 30 years have been trying to advocate. Uh, for the unborn and advocate in a pro-life manner in this country as we've tried to deal with abortion. The Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission has been one of our leading groups who has uh, has been our leading group. They've, they've helped with that advocacy. They've helped with crisis pregnancy centers and those types of, of, of ministries. And in fact, even now, as, as we go towards the next round of what that looks like, they're trying to help advise what that looks like on state and state level. Uh, and their president, every one of our entities is led by a president who's elected by the board of directors anyway. It's kind of the president's responsibility to do the main plan and, and be the, the leader of the group. Well, the ERLC, we, we call these things by their short initials to save time. Preachers are always about saving time on everything but what we want to talk about, okay? Uh, but the ERLC has been without a president since about May of 2021. So they've been searching for somebody, and this week they, uh, their search committee, and it's, it, the process is a whole lot like looking for a pastor. You form a committee, and you start looking for resumes, and then interviewing people, and, and, and trying to work through all that. And so this week, the, the board actually met and elected their new president, and his name is Brent Leatherwood. Uh, and you may or may not know his, his name. You probably don't. The only reason I know his name is because he's the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, not somebody that I've you know played golf with or anything like that. Um, but I would ask you to be in prayer for him as he takes that role. Um, he is the face of Southern Baptist on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. That is what he is now charged with. That's his job is to call the White House and say, I need to let you know that Southern Baptists don't like this, or I don't need to let you know that Southern Baptists do like this. It's his job to try to get a hold of Nancy Pelosi and, and say, hey, the House of Representatives needs to not do, Southern Baptists will be angry about this. Okay, that's his job. So pray for the man, because that's 
That's his job. And then the other thing that's part of his job is when a Baptist preacher says, hey, I need to uh, try to help my church understand what's going on, for example, with immigration in the United States of America. Part of his job and the ERSC's job is to say, okay, well, we'll send you some stuff so that you can explain to your church what's going on and some scripture, you know, some, some, some understanding from scripture about what's going on with immigration in America. It is the smallest of the entities that we have as Southern Baptists. Therefore, it is the lowest funded, but y'all, it's a fairly important batch of responsibilities that they've got. So I would ask you to pray for uh, uh, for, for Dr. Leatherwood. He's got you know, one of the requirements for the job. He had to have a, a PhD in something, uh, and it's supposed to be something useful. But I think he's got New Testament theology, so I don't know if it's useful or not. But uh, but uh, he uh, so you know, but pray for Dr. Leatherwood and the rest of the staff at, at ERLC um, as they as they do that work. So I'd ask you to pray for them and then pray for us. It, it, uh, alongside that, there is some significant voting to go on in November of 2022. Um, you know, midterm elections are a big deal. We'll elect a new governor in our state. Um, and that's, uh, uh, before anybody says, what, you don't like Jason Hutchinson? The term limited out. He can't have a job anymore. Somebody else has to be governor. That's the rules. Um, so, our democracy operates by rules. We're supposed to follow them. Uh, so we'll have we'll elect a new governor. Uh, we'll elect you know se several things, several new folks will be going into various positions. So we need to be in prayer for that. Uh, but be in prayer for the ERLC. And so I'd ask you to, to pray for them and for Brent Leatherwood specifically as he leads that group. And so let's take a few moments of quiet prayer there where you are, and then I'll lead us in Lord's prayer to be on the screen. So let's pray. You join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 29. So we continue on with our with our Psalms. And I'll, I'll warn you, next week we'll do a Psalm as well, and then we'll go on to other things in October, but If we were if we were one of them really cool groovy churches with the you know the clear pulpits and the fan, and the fancy looking preacher, we'd have a cool logo for Psalm September because you know September that's what all sermons come from the Psalms. But, uh, my first the first church I pastored the uh, we were in a church council meeting and sweet older lady in the church and I won't even begin to uh, assume how old Miss Hill was but she was not young. And I don't think anybody in this congregation would have thought she was young. I mean, I think she's probably older than everybody here. 
but she had been in that church since it, almost since its founding. But she had been watching somebody on, on TV, you know, Baptist, Baptist preacher somewhere, may have been Charles Stanley, might have. But she made some comment about that church, and they have one of those clear pulpits that you'll see sometimes you visit. It's, that church got one of the, one of the good looking preachers with a clear pulpit. And I'm sitting right there, and I was like, mm hmm. That church, the wooden pulpit was as wide as this, but it didn't come in, it went out. Like, there was no visibility. And it's all the way over to here. I could stand here and said, so what does that say about me? With you know, that we don't have that that, that, that we don't have a, a clear pulpit for our preacher. And she just she she said, Oh, that's not what I meant. But she was a sweet lady. She was probably she was one of those folks, she played the organ and she would have been, you know, she was a fierce defender of that church and that church's pastor, no matter what, who he was, whether when they had a good one, when they had me didn't matter who it was um you know she she was good but anyway um but yeah we don't have those clear pulpits with a good looking preacher we just got the got the solid wood and you got me so psalm 29 and you know, so we don't have the cool graphics and, the, and everything else we just have have this that we go through the book find some psalms and and eventually we'll work our way all the way through the psalms in september so we'll get all the way to psalm 30 this september Next September, we'll make more progress, and someday we'll get all the way to Psalm 150, but, but we're not gonna, I'm not going to commit to that uh, to a specific time, you know, because that'll take several years. Psalm 29, though, is, again, a psalm of David. Many of the psalms, especially in the first half of the book of Psalms, are written, they're, they're attributed as being written by David. We think that he writes some of them while he's a shepherd, when he's out on the hills watching over the sheep and has a lot of time to reflect on uh, God's goodness and his, his graciousness. We know he writes others when he's in times of stress and strain. We know that he writes some when he is uh, comfortable as the king. And some we just know he writes, but we don't know exactly when. Uh, the text doesn't give us that. It just tells us it's a psalm of David. And so we have this, acknowledge the Lord. You heavenly beings, acknowledge the Lord's majesty and power. Acknowledge the majesty of the Lord's reputation. Worship the Lord in holy attire. The Lord's shout is heard over the waters. The majestic God thunders. The Lord appears over the surging water. The Lord's shout is powerful. The Lord's shout is majestic. The Lord's shout breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like the young ox. The Lord's shout strikes with flaming fire. The Lord's shout shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The Lord's shout bends the large trees and strips the leaves from the forest. Everyone in his temple says, Majestic. The Lord sits enthroned over the engulfing waters. The Lord sits enthroned as the eternal king. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord grants his people security. And so as we look at this this morning, I want us to look at this idea of the shout of the Lord. Now most of our Bible translations are going to put that as the voice of the Lord, but I, I like what the net does with it because it reminds us, it, it's this idea we sometimes put the voice of the Lord as something perhaps quiet and something unknown and unhearable and unclear. And yet a shout is something that we can't help but understand. A shout is something that's not lost in the midst of the tumult, that's not lost in the midst of all of the chaos. The shout is the idea of something that you can hear no matter what's going on. You can recognize the urgency and the clarity of it. Any parent knows what it is that sometimes you shout to get your children's attention. Not always in anger, but sometimes simply because you need to be heard. We've seen it with our kids where you know, we've been in the midst of, of a busy and chaotic time and around a whole lot of people and you can quietly say, hey kids, and you may get six or seven kids around you that you, they're not yours. And they look at you like, you're not my parent, and then they go on with their life. But 
have stood in a crowded auditorium filled with hundreds of noisy teenagers and shouted one of my children's names and from the far side of the room and all three of them turned and looked because they recognized the voice in the shout. The other things about a shout, shouts are what we do when we're excited. I don't know how many of you all stayed up last night to deal with the exhaustion hogs as they tried and tried to lose a football game, but, but finally managed to not. But there came a point where there was a shout of exclamation. I would call it something under an 82 yard punt return. There comes a point where we shout in exultation and excitedness because we cannot contain. And it is clear what we're doing. We shout. And so we look here and we see the Lord's shout. The Lord's shout is heard over the waters. For people who live by lakes, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But for people who live by rivers, you know what that means. You ever stood there by a creek as the water is running and rushing over the rocks and you try to have a nice, calm, quiet conversation? But you can't because you can't be heard over the waters. But here, the Lord is heard plainly over the waters. Why? Because he speaks clearly and he speaks plainly. The Lord's shout is powerful. The voice of the Lord is powerful and majestic. When God speaks, he speaks plainly and clearly. Now, some of y'all are about to jump into a cave with Elijah and go, wait a minute, I thought he was a still small voice. But it's an important thing to realize that what that's referring to is that he's a still small voice that over the noise of the whirlwind can be heard plainly and clearly. So while it may be a still voice, you should understand still there to be calm. Realize that God never gets in a hurry. Nor does he ever get frantic in the way he speaks. This is the difference, one of the differences between the shouts of the Lord and the shouts of the parent is that the parent occasionally shouts frantically, as does the boss at work and other people, where we shout in, in, in shock, alarm, frustration. But the Lord's voice, the Lord's shout is clarity and to be heard and to be understood. The Lord's shout is majestic. It's not a pleading, it's not a whimpering, but it's majesty. It is the clear voice of the King of Kings. The Lord shout that breaks the cedars. And traditionally, for many generations, it was common to store things in a cedar chest. We actually have one that goes back in Anne's family several generations. And while occasionally you have to do things like replace a hinge or do something like that, the, the wood is solid and long lasting. The cedars of Lebanon at the time were renowned being strong and mighty, and it resists disease and rot. It smells good too. That's why when it gets winter time and everybody keeps their windows closed, and you start going, you know, it smells a little weird in here. We would go out and cut down cedar trees and stick them in our house and put presents under them. Y'all, that's the origin of the Christmas tree as, as a tradition. The tree smelled good. If you've ever been locked up in the house and it was too cold for anybody to take a shower on a regular basis, you understand why you'd rather smell the tree. They don't rot. They drive out bugs not only from themselves, but that's why you stored your sweaters in a cedar chest. Because it drove out the moths, it dri drives out the bugs. Cedars are strong and mighty, they don't break easy. The voice of the Lord shatters them. Those things that seem to be in the way, 
with barricades that are as strong as a cedar, that are resistant to so much else. The voice of the Lord drives it away. Shatters the cedars of Lebanon and makes them skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young ox. And there he's talking about a mountain that the voice of the Lord not only shatters wood, but it makes mountains jump. And I don't know about y'all, but I've never seen a mountain jump. In fact, I would suggest that you know, most of the time, if you want something that's going to consistently be there, all the time, it's going to be in the exact same place that you left it, a mountain would definitely be one of those. You know, I almost don't need directions back to Petty Jean. I know exactly where it is. It's going to be right where I left it. And yet, the voice of the Lord makes a mountain skip like a young calf. Move. The voice of the Lord is powerful and majestic. This, this is what God does when He speaks, strikes with flaming fire, shakes the wilderness, bends the large trees. Strips the leaves. And yet, when we see the voice of the Lord in his majesty and in his wonder, and, and you can reach over into 1 Kings and pick up where God speaks to Elijah and he's in the cave and he's afraid. He tells Elijah to go and I'm going to speak to you. And there's a storm and there's a whirlwind and there's a fire and the voice of the Lord is not there and then it's on top of those things in the midst of all that there is that clear voice speaking and he doesn't destroy Elijah when the voice of the Lord is heard in Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah is standing there as the prophet and he stands there and he sees God I am exalted in his temple Voice of the Lord speaks, but Isaiah is not destroyed. Ezekiel stands by the by the by the river as he stands there with the people of, of Israel in exile. It sees the presence of God and hears God speak to him, and yet he is not destroyed. The Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples. They are not destroyed. When he calls Peter aside after his resurrection and talks to him about what he had done and asks him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you actually love him? Peter's heart may be broken, but ultimately he is not destroyed. Risen Christ appears before John on the, on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation. Again, he speaks, he, he sees, and yet he is not destroyed. Why is it that the voice of the Lord is so powerful and so mighty that it could destroy all things? And yet all the scripture, we see all these people who speak with the Lord. Abraham speaks with him face to face. In fact, he even argues with him in Genesis 18. Hey, why, why would you destroy that city? <laughs> Moses speaks with him face to face. After the golden calf, when the Lord is ready to destroy the people of Israel, Moses says, don't please, you know, don't do that. That's a bad idea. <sighs> and it is this, the voice of the Lord is strong and powerful and majestic and yet also personal and compassionate. The same Lord who when he speaks makes the mountain skip like a calf. The same Lord who when he speaks can be heard over the mighty thundering waters. The same Lord who can, who can destroy with the word is also the one who is personal 
and compassionate to his people. John chapter 8 gives us a story of the voice of the Lord. When the Pharisees take a woman caught in the act of adultery and throw her at the feet of Jesus. And as she is there, and they try to pick it, pick it to, at, at the minutiae of the law, that whole situation should get it, get its own sermon one of these days. But they look at they look at Jesus and say, "We're supposed to stone her," and Jesus just looks at him and in the voice of the Lord says, "Okay, the one who is without sin can cast the first stone." The voice of the Lord was compassionate and truthful. And you know what we tend to miss in that story. We tend to read that and we should catch this part. Oh, the one without sin should cast the first stone. And so therefore, the Pharisees, the older ones first, because older guys are sometimes wiser than their husband, yeah. Walk away. But you know who was there? Jesus, the one without sin. There's actually somebody there that could have stoned her. And all he needed to do was toss the first one. The voice of the Lord says, the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And then once everybody else is left, he looks at her and says, well, where's the guys that condemned you? And she says, nobody left. And the voice of the Lord speaks that neither do I condemn you. The voice of the Lord is compassionate. The voice of the Lord is merciful. The voice of the Lord is mighty and directed because he tells you to go now and leave your life of sin. The voice of the Lord is all of these things. The Lord would have every right in his majesty and his power to look upon us and break us like a cedar. But instead, he looks us in the eye and says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The voice of the Lord says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. The voice of the Lord says to John, All who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. The voice of the Lord calls to us to say, With grace and forgiveness, Not because the Lord is not so weak that he cannot execute justice. Not because the Lord does not care about sin and righteousness because everything that we see tells us that he does. But the voice of the Lord is also merciful and compassionate and is the voice of love that will not extinguish a smoldering wick or break a bruised reed. But it's also the voice that will come. In the last days, as the rider on the white horse and the sword that comes is the voice of the Lord. So we have choices before us. But one choice that we cannot make, because all that's left, all that would be left here would be an excuse, would be to say, well, we didn't know what the Lord had told us to do. Because the voice of the Lord is clear. So I don't know, I've been praying about whether I should do this or do that, but what does Scripture say? The voice of the Lord is clear about the ways in which we should live, that we love our neighbors as ourselves, that we show the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So in that decision that's in front of you, that you say, well, I'm waiting for the Lord to make it clear, does one decision look like loving neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself, and showing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? And the other decision doesn't look like that? The voice of the Lord is clear. The 
voice of the Lord has spoken about what we ought to do. Go, make disciples of all nations. Teach them to observe all that he has commanded us. Which is to love our neighbors ourselves and to cultivate love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, eventually through repetition, we're all going to have Genesis 5, or Genesis, Galatians 5, 22 to 23 memorized. The voice of the Lord is clear. What he's called the church to be, a house of prayer for all nations, a place that people love one another, because by this will all men know that we are his disciples, by our love for one another. The voice of the Lord is clear about what a church ought to do. They gathered for, to study the word, to look at the apostles' teaching, to worship together, to fellowship, to break bread, and to pray. The voice of the Lord is clear. So we don't have the choice about whether, we can, whether or not God has been clear. We have the choice about whether or not we listen. We have the choice about whether or not we listen when God calls us and says, repent. And trust, it, 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 as we sang about the, the blood of Jesus washing us from all of our sins, the forgiveness that comes, because Jesus died in our place. God has called us to that clearly and plainly, that if you haven't done that, you need to do that. God has called us to it. His voice speaks plainly in Scripture. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's spoken plainly about that. You have a choice about whether or not you've answered it. And that voice doesn't say that the answer is that you take Jesus and these other things. Well, that when the offering plate had come past, if you had just put a little bit more money in there, you wouldn't actually have to surrender your life. God cannot be bought. And he especially can't be bought cheaply with things of this earth. What have we do with what have we done with Jesus? What have you done with the voice of the Lord calling you to salvation? What have you done with the voice of the Lord calling you Christian? When he has said, here is how you should serve. When he has said, here is how you should share the love that I have. Here is how you should share the message that I have given you. What have you done with what the voice of the Lord has said to do? Because the voice of the Lord is not to be ignored. But many times we've tried to do so. We've tried to stuff up our ears. We've tried to turn up the noise around us. But it's time that we listen. Because the Lord sits enthroned over the waters. Enthroned is the eternal king. He grants his people strength. He grants his people security to do what he's called us to do. So what about you and what have you done with the voice of the Lord? Have you listened? Do you make time in your life to listen to the voice of the Lord? And then have you obeyed? It is not enough to check off the box and say, yeah, I tried to listen a little bit today, but I didn't do anything about it. We're called to do. Let's listen. Because the Lord's shout is powerful and majestic, personal and compassionate to us. And he calls us to himself that we would know him See, the reason my children know the sound of my shout across a crowded room is because they know me. 
You say, yeah, because you yell at them all the time. No one up there. I recognize their shout from across the room. In a room full of teenagers and parents, I don't respond to every shout for dad. I respond to about four of them, because some people do actually sound like my kids. But aren't. So I can recognize theirs. God calls us to know him so that we can recognize his voice as he speaks. And with that in mind, one of the things that we're going to do in just a moment is we're going to come to the table together as his people. God calls us to do that, to stop and to listen, to remember him. And it is his table. It's the voice the Lord calls us to. But before we come there, we're going to sing another hymn. And we'll pray and then we'll invite the worship team to come back up and, and lead us. And, and that last hymn we're going to sing is I Surrender All. You see, that's what the voice of the Lord says to us is to surrender. So I challenge you to make sure that that is a part of your prayer today and that that is a part of what your commitment is for the coming week. That you will surrender all. That you hold nothing back. It's not the time to try to hold back a little for a later day. There is no time for that. Give it all you got. Surrender all to Him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We pray, Lord God, that you will help us to listen plainly to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.